thing to renew. They're only going to hear you at first. Okay, we're going. And we are live. Okay, can everyone hear us? You should be able to see the um, graphic here on the website. This is from the altpropulsion.com website, uh, being made by uh, Tim Ventura. And we are here in the lab with Jeremiah and Sean. And uh, we're going to turn on the Skype right now. Everyone can see what's going on. Here is Sean. Yowza. Here. How's it going, guys? Sean, what do you got for us here? Sean, your audio is a little uh, cut out. There, there we go. Um, is that better? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Right on. Okay, so yeah, this is the uh, Thomas Townsend Brown battery. This is pretty much what you guys were attempting to do, was pretty much creating an electorate uh, before. Uh, um, I just thought I'd bring that to people's uh, attention. Uh, it's pretty basic. It's a uh, basic battery right here with the load, and uh, how it's done is you put the high voltage system on when you're uh, creating your electric and then uh, you're hitting it with a high voltage and uh, letting it cure and it's supposed to hold a self potential okay uh, uh, that was just uh, a little example and uh, this is also uh, this is just uh, how Thomas Townsend Brown was creating patents for this kind of stuff uh, before uh he was also showing how there's like different wiring, uh, different circuits you could uh, do and like how you can, you know, have them in parallel in series to the load. Um, yep. What exactly uh, does this thing do? Uh, the, that's, that was, that's pretty much the electrics that you guys were creating in the lab there. Like it, that's pretty much the same effect that, uh, uh, you saw what happened in the, the lab. You guys were pretty much pretty. Just thought I'd bring that to people's attention. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the, Jeremiah and I were talking about that, but uh, he has more information on that. I'm just presenting. <laughs> well, we had we, we had some trouble with doing, the electrodes. Uh, the measurements we were taking were interfering with the scale, and they were interfering with the table as well. So there was uh, lots of problems over there. Um, that was a live shot from the lab in Milwaukee. We have two experiments going on tonight um, here in Hawthorne, New Jersey. We're trying the Easy Alzafon experiment, which is basically spinning aluminum disc inside of a magnetic field. And I'm working on trying to make the uh, magnetic field sort of pulse. Um, and that is something we are working on right now. sucks this, this is the computer oh. that i wanted to be on oh, oh well. here i am yes yeah so we're, i'm working on the uh at the lab here in hawthorne new jersey and uh, i'm gonna have to reconfigure this uh these tubes over here to allow me to impulse the um coil for this easy alcephon experiment without destroying my power supply with the first pulse because it's going to be a ac you know sinusoidal wave going back and forth a little um a uh, spark gap that will uh, basically pulse this spinning aluminum disc with a uh, hopefully a high potential uh, magnetic field back and forth and that should sort of uh, create some sort of uh, gravity shielding effect. We will see what happens as soon as we try it and uh, Jeremiah is in his lab in Milwaukee and he will show us what he's going to be doing as soon as he's ready. Let me try this. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, let's see what we got here for you guys. Uh, go to the MHD stuff. Now, um, we were talking about gravity wave stuff at that APAC. Do you remember that? Uh, 
a giant tokamak that was like creating gravity wave generator pretty much uh, I, I found a pattern that resembles that uh, once I find him So here's here's uh, of, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but actually I'll go back to the original pattern here. I shared this with uh, Jeremy once on his channel. Um, right here, this is the uh, Joseph Hall pattern for high energy gaseous plasma containment, and that's that's pretty much the tokamak. Like every tokamak uses this pattern for that uh, that containment system. Um, but this, it, it's, uh, it's from uh, Josephine. And uh, not even a year later, he was put on this team to build one this device right here. And uh, this device is pretty much half of that gravi gravity wave generator. If you just wrap the tokamak coils around it, it would pretty much become exactly what that device is or what he proposed that device would do. Um, I, I, I'm not too sure exactly what... That's my belief. I don't really know exactly, but uh, you can uh, you can create high-pressure rotating plasma with this <clears throat> and use it as a, a ketamastic type of effect to create waves, uh, gravity wave generation. Um, do you know anyone who's currently working on that? No, actually, uh, I just, uh, and on APEC, um, <clears throat> a gentleman proposed it. I can't remember his name off, off the top of my head, though. Um, I have to, I wish, I wish I could get, uh, I wish I could get out their names and ask them to put stuff on the drive so I could explain it better. Like his, uh, presentation, just show it to you. But, uh. <clears throat> yeah, uh, there's that. Alright. Here's this newer pattern of it. And, like, you could tell he was creating units that were obviously pretty small. Like, that looks like a screw. You know, machine screw. Right there. So I'm, I'm guessing he made, like, small units. Yeah, it's pretty wild stuff. Well, what, what exactly would that do? Uh, it was just a gravity wave generator that would, uh, for use of propulsion, um, Jeremiah would know more about it than I. I just see it and see the relation and present it to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's like, yep, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, uh, Yeah, this is uh this this is uh from the same uh a company. It's actually the company's name was uh Space Technologies sorry, yeah, Space Technologies Lab Incorporated. And uh right here it shows the uh tip of the rocket with the coil, which you commonly hear that they do to uh reduce aerodynamic drag. And then these are some uh, plasma generators, generators and propulsion exhaust systems. Uh, they're pretty wild. And this is all from the same company. And this is from back in the uh, late 50s. Like this patent was presented at in 1959, it was released 1967. Like.
like you know that's old school stuff and here they like these are pretty much just jets that could literally use MHD and fly around <laughs> share the screen for a second and just show you guys what exactly it is I'm working on. Oh, excellent. Hold on one second. Um, video captured device. Okay. So uh, we have these uh, two tubes that were set up with uh, their own little power supplies. Uh, unfortunately for this experiment, these power supplies are not sufficient to power the coil. So I'm going to be disconnecting them from the circuit. So leave them attached. And we're going to use these rectifier tubes to isolate the power supply, which is going to be our 125,000 volt, um, you know, gamma high voltage research uh, power supply over there. And uh, we're going to hook these up in series, so we have double the isolation. Reason why we need so much isolation is because, again, it's going to be a sinusoidal wave um, that's going between the capacitor and the coil. And in order to um, end up with a uh, you know, not blowing up our power supply, we need to have some rectification in the uh, in the circuit or isolation in the circuit. And uh, this is this is a setup that Jeremiah built. It's pretty nice. I'm kind of uh, sad that I'm going to have to uh, modify it. We'll make sure that it will be uh, repairable once it is. You know that these uh, modifications are complete. And uh, Jeremiah, are you are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I'm definitely listening in to uh, everything that's going on here. I'm just not chiming in via video yet. So let's talk about what's going on there. And yeah, I, I would actually say maybe try to charge it up with that power supply first. But hey, I, I ultimately know the gamma is a much better solution. It has the power output, that's for sure. This and you have a perfectly suitable 100 milliamp rectifier dual diode there. So might as well hook it up and make it work for what it, uh, what it costs, which was very little, in fact. We got a pretty good deal on those diodes, Mark. No doubt about it. Yeah, it's not about the the deal on the diodes. It's really about the amount of labor that went into uh, setting it up, which was probably one or two nights of of work. Oh, indeed. But the good thing is replication. People have labor. They just don't have the money. So if they've got the labor and they're willing to work for it, build, build, build. It's not expensive. Okay. What's going on in your lab right now? What are you working on? I've got the Spark app set up. I was just uh, testing this thing out. Actually, if you want to take a quick look, I know we have uh, pretty much no viewers, and we probably won't have very many viewers, but let me just go ahead and put the mute on that, and then we'll switch to this noisy thing. So We can't see you can your screen. It. We can't see your screen, so why don't you share your video? I think... Um... So here we go. This is the noisy, terrible thing. So this is the mechanical rotary switch. And that's hooked up to the supply for now. And so uh, we just have that hooked up to a coil of wire. This is about maybe eight turns of it. It's a high current impulse from these low ESR snubbing capacitors. And we're running it off DC. So it's a zero voltage switching circuit modified ZCFL transformer right there. So we'll go ahead and, t and start up the noisy spark app and you won't be able to hear me all that well, but then I'll show you the foil and take a well, look. One second, the Sean, can you uh, stop the uh, share screen so we could we can see uh, Jeremiah's? Sure. Okay, there we go. Now we can see you. You can explain exactly what it is we're looking okay, at. Okay, so here's the setup. Um, I can see that I'm still in the corner of your video there. You should really, you know, stretch that out. Looks like either that or I'm just 15 seconds behind. But yeah, maybe stretch that video out because we're in the upright corner. It looks like. Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good now. We can see you. Okay, it's uh, it's too late. Anyways, yeah, here we go. That's the capacitor bank. That's the uh, CCFL modified transformer, and the ZVS driver. This is the pre-charged bank, and then that goes through a single rectifier through a full bridge, and then through a uh, inductor, and that creates a charging network, which offers a pretty high charging efficiency to the whole system. So we'll flip this on, and like I said before, you know, you won't be able to hear me much when this is running, but it is what it is. That is sick. <laughs> wow. It's it's sticking because it's you know it's getting it's getting hot pretty quick, you know. Heats up. There's a lot of. Oh, I think I may have. Oh, good. I didn't knock out my video. 
Anyways, there's enough current here where if I actually, you know, like that foil wants to have momentum. So if I let the, if I let the electron momentum repel and push this thing away, it can kind of convert some of that into some forward linear thrust. But if I push, push it down by setting something on top, watch of this. See if I can get it to do it. Oh, I can't. It was actually causing sparks to fly out of the co of the uh, foil itself, almost like mini EVOs that being formed in the foil. Not doing it now, you know. But either way, yeah, we had sparks actually shooting off the surface of the foil, almost like there was such a large current loop flowing through this thing that literally tiny gaps or imperfections within the foil itself were causing some uh, expulsion of other pieces of aluminum or other contaminants in the surface. So that's kind of interesting. I've never seen that effect before with a uh, completely flat piece of foil like that. Normally it either fails or it doesn't, but in this case we had sparks coming straight off the surface. So that's pretty interesting. But yeah, that's the basis. Like, it's not a complicated thing, but I'm gonna replace this whole entire circuit here with an SCR, and uh, I'm gonna drop the voltage down on this and increase the current, and we can deal with some of these inductance issues. Charging-wise, it's really efficient, uh, but in terms of repeatability, I do not like something that sounds like this. That's pretty terrible, even though it works really well. So we gotta, we gotta replace that with solid-state components for sure. But at least we have pulse power now. We have pulse power at 7 kV and a decent amount of current, too, enough to apparently make sparks fly off of a piece of aluminum foil with uh, no holes in it. And uh, th this is for, this is a component for which experiment? This is a system that we can use for multiple experiments, including what you're doing tonight, interestingly. Of course, you're kind of on your own with what you've got to set up tonight because you don't have this thing sitting there, but we'll be able to use it for the same type of purpose. And we'll use the SCR version too to pulse that electromagnetic coil so that we can have a non-continuous field. And if we do get Lamore precession in that piece of aluminum by proxy of the magnetic flux and the rotation, then the pulsing circuit, whether it be solid state or mechanical rotary gap, will still allow us to have a changing field almost continuously. So it's, it's multi-purpose. It's just a piece of technology that we're going to use for various experiments. Okay. It uh, looks like, Sean, you have the screen again. Uh, why don't you show us some more of those patents, and uh, I'll get back to work here in the lab. Um, just uh, beware of one thing. I am going to uh, grab a corner of the screen. Uh, the top the top half of the screen uh, will not be showing on the live stream, so uh, that that will just be showing live from the lab. So keep that in mind. Sean, are you with us? Yeah. Uh, is Jeremiah still around? Oh yeah, I'm just I'm just here in the background because I'm doing other stuff. I don't want my audio to bleed through and make lots of noise. I just got myself muted until I go on to actually speak. That's all. Okay. But I'll be here in, dark, in the entire time, Sean, so okay. stick around. Yeah, I, I, might, I might need you to jump in a bit. I may, yeah. I'll, I'll stick around and listen for you. All right. All right. So um, I guess we can go to the MHT drive or the MHT part of the drive. and. Uh, Sean, if I could just ask one thing. Uh, when you're doing these presentations, dumb it down. Yeah. You know, give, it, give it over as if you're speaking to uh, third graders, okay? Sure. Because we don't know who's out there, and we, we want we want the lowest common denominator. Everyone understands it, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this is Leek, my robo. He uh, he he did a lot. Uh, he did a lot for this kind of uh, technology. Um, he did the Lightcraft technology. Uh, oh, the air spike technology. Um, many many different types of MHD technology it all to light uh, um, this is one of his best documents uh, let me get down to the good spot yeah okay so right here uh, it this explains how the uh, the expansion of the path of the uh, plasma creates thrust and directions and uh, and how the air spike is used to uh, pretty much heat up in front of the craft so that the aerodynamic drag is reduced. Uh, it's using microwave beams, um, and they refocus the microwave beams to the surface of the craft. 
Um, let's see right here. So right here, I've explained this on Jeremy's channel, but uh, the Lorenz Force takes place in the uh, shear layer at the bottom, and it traps a vortex in there, and uh, Stan Deo calls this the Lorenzo, and uh, Stan claims that's the power of the craft. I think it's more or less the uh, leading edge here. The, uh, microwave. I would actually look at the Lorenzo as a B-cross B-field in space itself. I wouldn't look at it as a plasmatic effect, although you can certainly optimize a plasma with a vortex field. I would actually say that what Stan Dale is proposing there is when you cross a B-field in one uh, tangent and across the B-field at another tangent, you end up with a unique force. This is sort of like you know the physicist's question of what happens when a photon crosses a photon in some volume of space where they are destructively interfering they actually pop out you know, opposite as if they had never interacted but if we try to measure them while they're crossing we measure that there's no photon there the field seems to disappear but the question is where does the energy go that the photon contains and so what Stan Deo is saying is with Lorentz so you cross this B field this magnetic motional field that's being radiated off of your toroidal core and you cross that with a uh, B field of a linear core on another tangent and what you end up creating is a compression that takes place as a result of the space-time uh, of the curl vector, specifically the magnetic curl vector in uh, the quaternion equations of Maxwell, you end up with this uh, amount of space that actually has a different velocity of magnetic propagation because space itself has a limited capacity to store fields. You know, it's the carrier of the electromagnetic fields. And uh, as far as the theory that I've I put forth, so uh, there's there's a several theories that are kind of competing on this subject. I know uh, Jason, who's in the chat today, he's got his own. He's actually working on a fantastic presentation where he's going to present what he's come to discover over the course of years. And uh, a ton of work has been put into that. So that I'm very much excited about hearing his perspective on. But so far as we're looking at here, it seems that there is a variable factor within space itself where it acts sort of like a capacitor, like a dielectric in uh, electrical senses and it acts sort of like a permeable magnetic material in magnetic sense meaning that if you start to put in flux either electrical or magnetic you end up with a different amount of uh speed that the flux will travel through that space if there's already a present flux that's different in the background and so we're looking for those effects now yeah <clears throat> so this is I, I liked about this uh effect here actually it's, uh, he's, he's referring it to the aerodynamic plug nozzle, which is what air, people call the aero spike. And what's happening here is the plasma is falling in the convection of the uh, trap tor uh, trapped vortex at the bottom. And uh, normally the flame would hit the sidewalls, but instead it's just rotating this smoke ring. It's like, it's literally, it's, it's a smoke ring that's trapping and rotating the plasma and uh, creating far more force. I, I think it's a really great idea anyways, personally, looking at it. Because everyone always Yeah, Leak has a really brilliant idea with being able to concentrate a plasma there and create a maximum pulse of force from that plasma. And in his great idea, you don't have to store all that power on board. You can beam it straight in. Here's the yeah. part that kills us about Leak Mirabeau. He had all this stuff in the 90s, and he was featured on PBS and Nova, and you know there were there were lots of programs covering this technology of laser laser propelled craft or microwave propelled craft, where you could ground station these things and power them so you could get basically from from Earth to orbit by using power that you don't carry on board. But unfortunately, his projects, along with many others like his, up and evaporated with uh, no seeming notice. His website finally disappeared in about uh, 2017 when he i guess stopped paying for it and that was the last information we've really heard much from him so uh, i guess the big question is what happened to this brilliant man and his technology who was going to literally revolutionize the uh space exploration industry by getting us into orbit much more efficiently whatever happened to his tech yeah i know it's a shame man because he he seems like a great person i bet you he's an awesome teacher i cannot wait to get in contact with him at least to track down the dude's phone number Cannot wait to make that call and hopefully convince him to speak on APEC. I know he's got a lot on his mind, but I know we have to be patient and wait another year before he's actually able via NDA to talk about things. But, oh, man. No, Come I'm on. Sure we, 
I'm sure it can. He talked about it in a book. I don't, can't see why he can't talk about it on. I'm sure there are things he can certainly release and at least educate us dummies out there. Well, a lot of it's already <clears throat> in the uh, public domain like this. This is a NASA document, so. Um, Jeremiah, just a quick question. Uh, do you remember where that uh, adjustable yes, spark gap uh, device is here in the lab? You know, bin it's in? Well, you had one strapped to the Maxwell's. It was sort of sitting over the top of those things, and the other one was literally bolted straight to that large paper capacitor. So you had I'm not both those that's options. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spark gap. There was an adjustable spark gap that had, like, um, threaded uh, knobs and, like, two flat ends on it. It was pretty small. No, I don't remember ever really looking at that, but if it was anywhere, I'd have to guess it was on the table with where all the other stuff was received by the microwave equipment and beam guide stuff out in the uh, work room there. No, I think uh, it's, just it's outside with the, the high door. voltage stuff. If it's not stuff. there, I'm not sure where it would be. It's with the high voltage stuff somewhere. Well, I'll, I'll look around for it. I'm sure you'll find it. It's got to be around. Yeah. You yeah, your, just... Who doesn't want a flying suit that levitates you into the craft and is powered yeah. by microwaves? <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. So this is the uh, Meglip belt, and you could, um, in his book, he has, he has a book that explains far more depth than this, these documents, but uh, he has wristbands and ankle bands to uh, stabilize you as you obviously go up in the craft. And right here, he explains how it's done. He's So the Meglip belt's on the ground here, and he uses the craft to suck the person up into the vehicle into these tubes which he shows in his book <laughs> yeah I can just imagine <laughs> oh yeah all the more the docking platform I, I you just step on that thing it goes up like a freaking uh, wireless elevator and straight up into the craft and then the door is open and you're inside yeah. Awesome is what that is. I just want it's, to see someone get sucked into a spaceship like they do on the in the movies. I just want to see that. <laughs> I know it's not quite a beam me up, Scotty, but let's face it, we'll settle for anything right now in 2021. We still don't have flying cars, and they promised us we'd have flying cars, so damn it, we've been gypped. It's time hope, to get on this tech. I just hope the first time it's absolutely ridiculous. Like the guy has absolutely no stabilization. He's just kind of like <laughs> he's like swirling <laughs> around in the air, like upside down and whatnot. <laughs> you'll, you'll you'll still get into the craft one way or the other. You just might not look the most graceful as it's happening without the stabilization puffs. But I'd still settle for that. I'm not gonna say no. <laughs> I want to fly on board the MHD Express. Come on. Yeah, hold on. I'll get to a good part of this video real quick. I'm pretty sure you can see it. I don't know. We can see it. We can't hear it, but we can see it. And what a beautiful little piece of equipment he's got there. You can't hear any of this? Oh, wait. Maybe I can. That's right. I'm on the uh, call. Sorry for the super long delay. Yeah, I'm like 30 seconds behind on the live video to check to see if we could hear it. I'm not uh, hearing any audio on the live stream, oh. so. Oh, darn. I'm not hearing any audio, too. Oh, it just started. Weird. You can't hear it at all? Uh, we hear you. We don't hear the audio from whatever it is you're showing us. Okay. Only as no, I don't. It's not, I don't think that's it. Hold on. I think I'm just gonna make my uh, a custom spark app using these uh, little round balls. Sounds like somebody. They're working great for me. You might as well. Sounds like somebody has the audio on on YouTube as well. You got to turn that off. Oh, Leave this on Sean's end. Yep, that's that's how that's how yeah that's the sound now. It's working. We could barely hear it. Yeah. All right, I just I, I got the sound working though. 
<laughs> Anyways, as low as it is. So this is pretty much the craft uh, that he was showing there. Uh, this is done by, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember, Popular Mechanics in 1995. Uh, that's just a quick little article. Um, yeah, he has a giant uh, gimbal. Or whatever you guys call it. Top. That thing is huge. Highly polished. It is designed to capture the laser beam that is projected to it from the ground. Uh, Jeremiah, what would you recommend for a uh, spark gap distance? What's your discharge potential? Uh, I'd start out at about one millimeter and I'd open it up from there up to about a maximum of five millimeters. Okay, should I also throw in some resistors between the power supply and the- Between uh, the power supply? Yes, definitely. Just in case the uh, rectifier happens to have a problem and it bypasses, at least you have something in there to kind of protect it. I would highly recommend resistors. Okay, I have these resistors that we use for the marks. Uh, how many of them do we need? I would go with about 10 of those things. Oh, 10. You should be able to find, I think there's still one chain maybe left in there. Um, uh, uh, well, ten of them in ten of them in total. I would I would use uh, I would use five in series and then five in series and those two series sets in parallel. And you'll see on the bottom of the marks I have a bank kind of like that. Only I use eight plus eight in series, so sixteen in total. But you don't need that many for what you're going to be running there. Well, it's only it's only able to put out five milliamps, so uh, I don't know if necessary. That many. Well, we're using the same supply to charge the marks, so it's kind of the same. Okay, so you're saying uh, five and five. We'll, we'll put that together right now. Yeah, that seemed to work pretty good initially for the Marks Bank, so I'm, I'm guessing it should work all right for what you're doing. They will get warm, and that's perfectly fine. So just don't have them setting against any surface that uh, will get burned. It will certainly, I would say, beneath the soldering temperature be okay. Okay, there we got, we got 10 of them. I just need to uh, solder them all together. Okay. How, uh, Jeremiah, what's the up, latest update on the Banduric experiment? Yeah. Banduric. Just a moment. Do you have anything to show on, on video for that? The unfortunate part about the Banduric experiment stuff I have set up now is I have to hold the experiment in one hand and control the knob with the other, and something needs to hold the camera. But oh. uh, I haven't got that quite set up yet. Yeah, if you give me about two minutes, though, I can make that happen. Yeah, you could you can make some makeshift thing happen for that. Of course. So I will catch you in a few. Okay. I'm going to start the soldering over here. You guys can all watch me solder. Okay, and I'll just talk about stuff on the drive yeah once you um update the uh the audience on the banderic device what exactly it is and how it works and all right jeremiah's better at that than i but i can give them uh, information on papers and stuff that they can get uh so this is yeah when i was papers. looking for richard banderic stuff uh sean found this paper which i did not know existed uh, he, he dug up a bunch of stuff about Derek that I had no idea was out there and got a couple of great papers that were fundamentally useful in producing the experiment in the first place. And Richard himself then helped foster greater information by sharing other stuff that he hadn't put up yet. So it's all been very good so far. And thank you, Sean, for deep digging and actually locating that. Yeah, like a week before you met him. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. Like, you were on it. You were on the ball already before I was even working on this stuff. It's pretty amazing. Sean is our deep digger. Yep. Yes, I am. He is, man. This guy can find anything. I can dig and dug the whole thing. Dig and dug it. So this is the rotating disc one you're doing, right? I take it? Yeah, that's oh. correct. Excellent. So I'm just gonna drop that tripod here like this. 
Uh, so the rotating disc is the, uh, there's, there's actually two rotating discs that we're talking about. There's the Bandurek experiment, which is also has a rotating disc. And there's the Easy Alzafon experiment, which is similar to what's going on in the center of the, uh, the ARV, which you can see over here. You got that aluminum flywheel with an electromagnet coil around it. And uh, being as it's a flywheel, it's obviously spinning. And uh, we're, we're looking for some uh, weight loss. We did try this with a static magnetic field, meaning that there was DC going through the coil. Didn't produce much of a result. Now we're going to try it with pulsed electromagnetic you know, forces going back and forth with a sinusoidal um, waveform. And that is what I'm wiring up right now to allow for that waveform to uh, be generated using our high voltage power supply and some high voltage capacitors. So we're going to be pulsing it back and forth with a little spark gap. It's going to be pretty cool and scary when I power it up. And we need to protect the power supply, which is what I'm doing with these uh, resistors. So if you want to try and get my video pinned up on screen, then I can show off what I have here for a Bandura disc here. Uh, you're going to have to do that on Skype because the Skype is showing up on the screen. So uh, do you want me to take off? Uh, yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Stop sharing for a moment. And uh, yep. let, let, let's. All right. So hopefully yeah, we I'm can not see sure you now. If this video is going to come up. Let me know if it does. It's up. It's up. We can see. Okay, it. cool. So. This is the copper disc. This is a piece of PCB. It's that G6 material. So nothing on the back side. Front side has been polished. And then there are six dividing rings. So the purpose of these rings on the front here, between each uh, ring segment, there's going to be a set of two diodes juxtaposed on opposite sides. And these are super low leakage diodes. I looked around online to find the lowest leakage diodes I could. I ended up with some dual diodes that have a rated specification of three picoamps reverse leakage. And even though they're only 80 volts a piece, the amount of relativistic field increase that we should be seeing on the surface of this disk is less than all six of those in series. So they should be able to hold back the voltage and keep it isolated to the outside. And with only three picoamps, I mean, they will still leak, but it's, it's going to give us a lot of time to take a look. So the idea with this system is that when you place a charge on the surface of this copper and you begin to rotate it, the fact that the charges that are trapped here are in motion cause their field their field apparent to a stationary frame of reference to seemingly go up so we'll actually measure from a stationary probe once the charge enters this disc that as it starts to rotate that probe will pick up a greater increase in voltage even though we're not adding any more power or any more voltage to the disc and that's the way that we detect that we know this effect is happening so let me go ahead and spin it up then And so I've been pretty uh, pretty pleased with it so far. And just trying to get the maximum RPM here is going to give us the greatest effect. So right now we're at we're at nowhere near max, and we can see we're uh, we're hitting right around. Uh, let me just get this right around. Uh, you know, you know, seven thousand to ten thousand RPMs. We're now we're okay. So let's uh, let's pump the RPMs up and see how fast we can get it going here. This thing really does scare the hell out of me. Because if it blows, it'd probably take a chunk of my arm out. Luckily, it's pretty strong fiberglass, so I'm not too worried. So we can see we're really clocking in. I, I'm, this is probably reading double the RPM. I think it's right around 16,000. Should be half of what it's uh, what it's displaying, just because that sharpie is kind of coming off, and this this tachometer sucks. Yeah, so we should be right around half of 27,600, 27,300, right around there. And I'm gonna put a digital tachometer on this thing too that's gonna be integrated into the system so we'll be able to monitor the live RPM. But either way, this will give us a live readout with uh, we're showing the amount of speed that we have on the disc, the amount of power going into the motor. And if we have a relativistic effect, we should see a drag force. So we should actually see the increased current on the motor power and a slight decrease in RPM as this thing rotates and that will show us that some of our angular momentum here is actually being loaded down which shouldn't happen if this field is symmetrical and that means it's uh, generating a linear force which we'll be looking at with the scale so that's the current state of van Dirk. um other things that we have on order now we also just found a source for the silver nanoparticles so we ended up ordering some 25 grams of uh, 20 to 30 nanometer sized silver nanopowder and it's it's almost entirely spherical so on sonication it should break up and that'll cause us to create a very nice dot product disc 
And once our meters come in from VWR, we'll be able to profile those disks and verify the increase in relativistic voltage as a result of the rotation speed. That should sum it up for Van Der current state. Uh, just to clarify, the the reason why you need those um, silver disks is, or silver balls is to create the dot product disk, which has complex high voltage fields emanating from every single uh, point of the disk, right? Yeah, that's exactly correct, Mark. So each one of those individual microspheres holds some charge, and it has a net amount of charge that's different than zero. And as a result, if it experiences a change, a slight change in voltage because each of those di each of those tiny little spheroids is isolated from the next, it can't leak off the tiny change in charge that it experiences, so it stays trapped within the matrix of the epoxy mixture on the surface of the disk. And it's free to experience a force that's not equal and opposite since it's not part of the same electrical circuit. So basically we have the equivalent area on our small five inch diameter dot product disc that's several meters in surface area because of the millions and millions and millions of microspheres that cover the entire surface of that, of that disc. And uh, so one disc has several meters of surface area and the other disc has only five inches of diameter of surface area. And the difference between those two is quite drastic. What kind of voltage are you running it at? In this case, we're probably gonna run it right around 12 kV, just because we wanna guarantee there's no leakage. But if I can get the thing fully insulated so that it doesn't leak even around 50 kV, I'll run it as high as it'll go. We just have to look for the amount of current draw from the supply and verify that it's not actually losing any of its charge off or between the disks, because if it loses any, effectively it stops working. All right. And the current draw should be coming from the motor, not from the high voltage, right? Exactly, yeah. Once the disks are charged up, there shouldn't be any more power furnished by the high voltage power supply. So at that point, power stops flowing from that and it just sits there idle and the motor should be entirely responsible for furnishing all the propulsive force. Very interesting. It is. It's a strange device. Can't wait to see if it works. Have you read any other papers that allude to a similar effect? Yeah, we have three other papers that all allude to something very similar. All they, did, they don't quite break it down in the same way that Bandurek's papers do. And that would be uh, that would be the LaForge patent is one that I would definitely reference. Serrano effect seems to relate to something similar with charge drift that has to do with isolated charges within the uh, compound. And uh, shoot, there's one other that I can't remember right offhand. And it also relates to, uh, to relativistic field differences in frames of reference. But... Uh, I'll have to get all that stuff up and share it with the audience. I don't have any of it sitting in front of me right now. But yeah, there are several pieces of information that make me consider this as a very valid possibility because he's not the, Richard is not the only guy who's ever mentioned a system like this. He's just been the one to really put it together in I think the most rebuildable, replicatable way. Right. How much would it cost like the average uh, Joe to replicate this experiment? That's a question that I'll be able to answer after I have fully replicated the experiment right now, uh, it looks like it has a come in point of around $400. And that will be for the RC stuff, for the motors, and uh, for the very expensive nanomaterials that you need to buy. That's the most expensive part is getting, getting these silver nanoparticles. Now you could buy a lot, lot smaller quantity. Let's say if you do it perfectly the first time, maybe you can get away with only getting five grams of the stuff for 65 bucks. And that's not a crazy high price, but that's assuming that you get it perfect the first time and you get your formula right and you get it thin enough and you get the particles close enough. But uh, since I don't know if I'm going to get that right, I got 25 grams so I can screw it up four times and still have enough to try once more. <laughs> yeah, because we all know we screw it up the first time. That's part of the game. Yeah, so it probably is a lot cheaper to replicate once you know exactly what to do. It's just figuring that out is going to be a little more expensive because there's trial and error. But it's definitely one of the cheaper experiments that we are working on. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Like the barrier to entry to this experiment, the difficulty is can you get a very smooth, polished metallic disc that has a thin metallic layer to spin at a high speed? And if you can pull off getting a disc to spin at high speed and balance it out, then you pretty much got the rest of this. It's just at that point figuring out how to make a material that has really tightly packed tiny little particles of metal suspended in a epoxy mixture that's uh, on the surface of a disc. And yeah, that's like 
kind of complicated sounding, but it's really not. You're just mixing up epoxy, putting a lot of metal into it, and kind of spreading it over a disc evenly, and then using some ultrasonics to spread the particles out, which is basically jamming a disc up against a sonicator and watching it go to town. So it's really not as complicated as it sounds. And I think that people could easily replicate this with a tutorial video. works i'm sure that will be a high school uh, science project in uh, a couple of years from now well john bedini did build what he called the school boat girl motor which supposedly was a system simply enough that a uh, according to him school girl could build it and so i kind of agree with the fundamental idea that uh if you can teach it to a fifth grader then you understand it and you should be able to replicate just about any of this stuff it's not so expensive to do it's just expensive to figure out once you figure it out, then it's cheap, cheap to repeat. Okay, here are the, uh, that's the row of um, resistors. I don't know if, I don't know if Jeremiah, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my live. Kind of agree with the well, I've got to wait for it. I mean, I'm about 30 seconds behind, so you can just start talking about it, and then I'll just wait for my screen to show me what you're showing YouTube in about 30 seconds uh -huh. after you say it. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, Sean, back to you. Uh, what else yeah. you got for us? Uh, those look good, by the way, Mark, those resistors. Thank you. Okay, yeah, this is just... Uh, That's it. Yep. Stuff. Yep. Yeah, take a close look at that. So you can see some of the discs there, and uh, you can see sort of what he did. He shows a picture of the disc a little bit above that, I think, Sean, in that, in that picture set. I think it's above that. You can see one of the uh, cross-product discs with the diodes on it. Yeah, so that, that black disc there, yeah, you see those two black discs? One of those uses carbon, that one uses carbon, and the one beneath it, now that uses that silver uh, nanoparticle stuff that I was talking about. So he's got just a very thin layer of a whole bunch of tiny little nanometer sized silver spheres. And those are put on via some kind of resin and stuck to the surface, and they're all slightly isolated from each other. And he calls it state of the art because he uses sonication and uh, a very special resin that he hasn't talked about, whatever it is. But uh, he uses that to suspend these little microparticles within that surface. And that seems to be the big key to make the system work, because the better you can make that particular part, the more force you get out of the system. That was, that's, that was my question, actually, about that. Thank you for answering it. Fascinating. Okay, we have currently uh, nine viewers on YouTube. Um, well, this is the first time we went live with a, an actual setup here, so uh, I wouldn't say this is too bad, but we are, we're doing pretty well, and um, I think this video will be watched again later, uh, later on by quite a few, and we'll make sure to uh, hit that like button and uh, hit the bell so we can get you guys updates next time we go live as well. And, uh, Still got a little bit more to go here with this experiment. Probably another half an hour of work in order to get this thing going. Um, just putting together the resistors to protect our power supply, and we're gonna have some cool sparks coming off this device, and possibly some weight loss. Hey, Sean, it's on you now. All what right, you, uh, you I was just uh, checking out Ben Derrick's patent here. Uh, yeah, he really goes into depth. There's a lot of information in there. Uh, as to how it works and if you read through the whole thing you realize there's a lot more possibilities than just uh what he's showing in the patent in terms of how you can make the system like this make force if you take a look at the magic of this system which is really the dot product disc having all these tiny little pieces of metal that are charged to a high voltage but not technically touching each other so they're all just separated by some distance if we take that as being the real key piece of the system that allows him to generate these relativistic forces and we expand that out to impulse systems where instead of a rotating disc you have a simulated moving field by the emission or radiation of an electric potential like a scalar potential such as that that a tesla coil produces it should still be possible to produce these same types of forces using a material like that of a dot product disc and and so there may actually be no need to use similar materials to produce a force with no moving parts that's fascinating but first, before I try to play around with variations, which he's already got a much superior variation of this that uses no moving parts already, and it just runs off current instead of high voltage, uh, I still want to play around with this idea of this current system since it's a lot easier to replicate than what he's working with now. Yeah, 
Ben Derrick is awesome. It's a pretty great technology, man, and it's, it it's there. He just gave away the instruction manual for anybody to duplicate if they would. And yet, you type it into YouTube, Richard Van Derrick, you find nothing except for the one presentation he did on APEC, which wouldn't have, wouldn't have existed at all if we didn't bust up to try to get him to go on there and, and present, which thank goodness that happened. But like other than that, there's nothing on this guy. Nobody's replicating his incredibly easy-to-replicate experiment. They're not spending the... <laughs> four hundred dollars or less to try to actually do this and here's a system which produces a reliable force if it works in a single direction and can be used for space drives but it gets no attention and so we have to do it we have to do it I just, you can't say no to something like this you really can't is next should we look at Rhoda or actually let's look at Kramer a bit here he's a shockwave modification patent the front of a vehicle yeah that's that's very related to Leak Mirabeau yeah and related to the B2 really leading edge field braking by using a charged corona wire absolutely Whether you use a plasma wire, an arrow spike, or a leading edge corona wire, all three effectively do the same thing. They virtually eliminate any kind of drag force over the surface of the wing. But they still allow the Renuli effect to compress the gases. The difference is the gases still get compressed based on the geometry of the ring of the wing, but they don't get stuck on the surface. So it just works much more efficiently and you end up generating much more lifts with the same amount of forward air velocity and with the same amount of forward air force. Man, these patents are wild. I should actually do the, uh, where is it? I think it's this one right here. No. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> this is an awesome patent. So it um, utilizes the um, the beam technology in order to control the flight path of a vehicle. So this could literally beam a target area, any part of the wings, in order to control the direction and flight of a of a flying object, another flying object in order to land it. That's wild. So it's, it's sort of like a, uh, you know, the, it serves the function of a tractor beam then basically. Almost, not really. It, it'd have to be in, in visual, in the yeah, visual area of it. And it'd literally be able to control it. Yeah, so I guess it could, yeah, literally, yeah. So what does it do? It just, it, it just controls the uh, expansion and compression of gases over the surface of the wing by using it, these energy beams? Exactly. Microwave it's, beams, right? Yeah, it's, it's it's heating the the leading edge and controlling where that heat is on the edges, uh, or actually in these spots right here. So yeah, the leading edges of the uh, of the flying areas here. So in order to control its flight and bring it down. Wow, that's wild. <laughs> uh, they're talking about how they wanted to use it for bullets as well. So like have a light beam that's look at that man it just cuts right through whatever it's going through as long as the beam uh heads in front of it hey yeah and like and like this also is talking about like how like they could have rotating discs within the light beam that spin way faster because there's no resistance no drag yeah that's freaking awesome Now we have to talk about the only downside to the tech. It needs a crap load of power. A whole yeah. lot of power. Oh, Under a megawatt, you're really not doing much for a uh, craft that can carry a person. Well, they have all different types. Like you could. Yeah, that's freaking awesome. You you could use like uh, what they have that one uh, 
crop that use like an iodine laser. So they use a lot less power in order to get more energy through using that as a fuel. Yeah, chemical lasers, I would agree, are definitely one of the ways to go. I mean, we have dye, dye lasers aren't what I'm talking about with chemical lasers. What I mean is a chemical that directly gets translated into photonic energy as it breaks down. It's one of those fantastic inventions that not a lot of people know about. But yeah, you can actually mix a couple of different chemicals inside a reaction chamber. And consequence of mixing these chemicals together in liquid or gaseous state is that it produces light and that light is reflected back and forth between two mirrors just like a conventional laser. The difference between a chemical laser and a normal laser is normal lasers you've got to put in power from the outside. A chemical laser generates all the power it needs from the inside so instead of adding electricity to it you add liquid fuel to it and it just generates a stupid bar of a beam. Boeing screwed around with this and they had a pretty decent output. DARPA screwed around with this I think they got a 50 kilowatt beam when they were playing around with it about 10 years ago. And so they're, uh, it's, it's considered one of the most compact laser technologies that we currently have as far as portability per kilogram. You can just generate huge amounts of beam power. But it's, it's pretty restricted as far as how they work. You're not going to find a lot of information if you type in chemical laser online. There can are just a few YouTube videos about it. Can you hear any sound? We cannot. Okay, hold on. Darn, it didn't do it right. Uh, uh, okay, we, we don't we don't see your screen now. We just see meeting with Jeremiah. And, uh, yeah. There we go. Why don't you do it? Why don't you share your screen again? Oh, there yeah. we go. We got it. Yeah, we got it. We got you back. So, uh... Can you hear any of that? No, it's extremely quiet. Um, you got to figure I out. I know where, that's where, so weird. Where, where's your audio input coming from? Is it from a microphone? No, no, it's it's going through my desktop, but it's uh, it's designed. It's I think it's because you're in a meeting. They can't that they they turn the volume down on other uh, videos that you present. of what I'm proposing and what I'm working on. So yeah, here's he, he's he's pretty much giving this away. Research. I'm going to have to do some videos on the primer cube. All right, hold on. I gotta get to the part where he's making gold with this thruster. Some of you know from watching my previous videos, and I don't blame some of you to be skeptical, but I do receive visions. I oh yeah, he's the vision I guy. Say, <laughs> everything I say is true because of my vision. I always go. I love the music. Everything out before I go and tell people publicly, other than my close friends. Right? Well, it's pretty wild though, eh? Gold decisions. being deposited on the uh, ceramic? 100% works. All the time. That is pretty wild, the idea that you just, oh, we end up with gold on uh, gold deposits on our ceramic. We have no idea where it comes from. It just seems to appear out of nowhere because no gold is in the system at all. Yeah, it's just, just hydrogen, oxygen, and... Uh, and his electrodes, copper. which are... Yeah copper they're copper electrodes yeah he, he wraps them up like a wire all messy looking sean, why, yeah that's why you, awesome sean why don't you explain to the audience exactly what it is we're looking at because we can't really hear the audio okay so this is the premier field guy um he he created uh he's showing the technology here where he made these magnetic bowls and it controls ionic flow and uh and like uh, he's trying to make a bat he's trying to make like a, a closed loop system with uh with those magnets where it'll just accelerate around a tube and create electricity this video is just a little preview of the two videos to follow that will be covering energy production then i'm going to be getting so is this like a free energy device no, there's you have to put energy in the system in order to get to start, so therefore nothing is a free energy device. Putting out the correct field that will allow you to gain the most benefit from a primer cube. Absolutely amazing technology. I'm very excited about that and what I hear from people. But once it's in motion, yes, it will stay in motion. Some of them are considered outright miracles. I believe. No doubt about it. Absolutely. Yes, a couple kinks in it. I will be explaining. We will be using this simple arrangement as to how we can achieve room temperature fusion, but it gets even better. 
I will also show you how in my vision a method was provided that will allow us to capture the energy produced in that room temperature fusion reactor and generate electricity without any moving parts. You can't hear any of that, eh? Oh, we can One hear it, yeah. Not know that that device will actually work, but it... Oh, shit. Fire my sword. <laughs> we could hear it, just your voice is a lot louder, so you gotta, like, tone down the, the voice is... so we can hear it. We can hear what's going on. Room temperature controlled fusion device that has no moving parts other than the pump required to pull a vacuum on the reactor. These reactors could be mass produced very inexpensively and could even be used to power automobiles. But once again, 2020 looks to be a big year, not only for primer cubes going into mass production, but we may finally have an answer for sustainable, pollution-free energy that does not rely on fossil fuels. That's wild. Keep up with all my latest developments, including the information that I will not be sharing elsewhere. Go to my website at www.primercube.org and sign up for my newsletter at the bottom of any page. God bless all of you and give you a great year ahead. Oh. And I was told to tell you this yet once again. I guess it's really important. Has that been uh, verified by anyone? Well, I think that's just the end of it right there. Has that been uh, independently verified by anyone? Uh, he has a bunch of stuff that's all been verified. Uh, like, he's done this. Uh, hold on, actually, I thought that was the video. Uh, here it is. There, th this is what he's doing, right? This is the magnetic field emitters were suspended on non-conductive, high-strength microfilament line attached to magnetic supports on the inner surface. So it's an ionic flow control mechanism using a magnetic then array. To hold these supports in place, high strength magnets were utilized on the outer surface of the vacuum chamber. This arrangement allows for the adjustment of the magnetic field emitters while the experiment is running. The small microfilament support lines also offer minimum disturbance of the plasma flow around the fields and therefore a more realistic experimental result. But anyways, yeah, he has fields like that. Um, it, these are, this is his patents for the magnetic array. And he's, yeah, like, we should, we should talk to him about getting that, uh, the uh, permission to use the uh, magnetic array to make that machine that he's talking about and see if we could reproduce it. Um, is Does that produce any sort of linear thrust or is it just purely a, uh, you know, like a free energy device? I, I, I don't know. I'm exactly I sure. Hold on. Theory. Well, that's a lot or no. Video is going to give you a little taste of the idea oh, I'm just gonna have to get to the right spot of the video I'm very to that in my vision all right vision vision okay there it is we're trying to stay away from anything that is free energy at the moment it's uh yeah it's not free energy it's 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 the magnetic the mag the magnets are the energy right it's just using it and keeping it in rotation uh it's removing the lens um the lens force there uh by having it bold shape again i do not know that that device will actually work but it appears there is no energy in a magnet yeah no no like yeah it's, it's just a transverse motion it's writing it's it's like what it's doing is it's uh um so if you if you wired it properly i don't know if you did or not but uh if you uh the back emf that comes back through the coil if you have um jeremiah has this there's a better way of doing it but for example if there was a switching diode in there and it and the back emf was flipped it would then just 
accelerate it faster forward. Accelerate what? Is like the magnets that are inside the loop. Okay, and what's the purpose of accelerating the magnets? Uh, in order to create electricity in the coils. Okay, and what's the purpose of creating electricity in the coils? To create electricity so you could have it and store it. That's just tur uh, turning, that's just basically a motor. That's just a, uh, it is, a generator. But, but it is, but it's, it's literally, it's throwing itself forward and not able to come back to like a back EMF effect because it's uh, defeating the lens force. So... Because it's bowl shaped right there. It's it's pretty wild. It, it's it's hard to explain because like you really need to actually look at what he's doing to get the full understanding of it. But uh, I don't know. It's just food for thought. You get, if you want to check him out, he's uh, David Lapointe. Uh, he's uh, on YouTube. All those, all those are all his videos that are on YouTube. They're an hour each, and. Uh, we talk about premier fields and he just got the thruster i just can't i just can't understand why the thruster video is not here i thought i uploaded it so the uh, the the magnets move in one direction and they they move, don't move back or something like that what, what exactly happens I, i'm still confused oh I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah i just found in the see how it shoots off over unit these are magnets right here right One. I'm just going to make it a little bigger. Then in the video to follow that one, I will be explaining in full the concept I was shown in a vision as to how we can achieve room temperature fusion. Yeah, right. uh, he's talking about so room temperature fusion. Yeah he's, yeah, he's talking about all the other stuff uh, that he, like, you know, I was getting gold deposits on the uh, surface of the uh, porcelain. Anyways, uh, so these magnets here are just going through the tube. They hit this magnetic bowl, right, which throws it through, and these coils pick up energy, right? Right. As we launch through. And there's other ways I was thinking, but that, he was just saying, like, create a closed loop system, like, somehow. And uh, he's trying to figure out, like, ways of doing it. And he wants, he wants people to try it out. And What is the purpose of this device again? Free energy? Or, to, is, or is this. Just uh, generate electricity, that's all. Uh, general, well, not only that, but uh, you know, like the uh, these are the same bowls that are used I mean, in you the can generate uh, electricity from premier the outlet, field but things, right? That, I, that I still we're don't just looking at. I still don't yeah, understand. What is the purpose of generating electricity? Like you can generate electricity just by turning a generator. Yeah, yeah, but uh, not that's not just that. It's the acceleration that uh, this comes out, and it's uh, really I just wouldn't mind seeing like the uh, bowl emitters be used, like they do for ionic flow control, like he does in his premier fields. I wouldn't mind seeing something like that being used. I don't know. It's, there's a few things that can be used for this type of system. It just you gotta. Jeremiah, are you? Do you have any idea what what, what we're looking at here? Jeremiah, are you there? I'm still I'm still pretty confused as to what it is I'm looking at. Um, it seems to me like just another uh, either like a rail gun for electromagnets for for magnets with electromagnets. Or, uh, no, no, there's there's no electromagnets. It's taking energy out of the system here. So like the these those coils these, are electromagnets. Yeah, yeah, but they're yeah they're absorbing the the electricity. They're not they're not using to accelerate it. What's accelerating it is the magnetic ball. There's a magnetic ball. Where's the magnetic that, ball? That that the ball. Hold on, I'll show you. Um, all right, so I go go back to the points. Where are you? There. All right, so you see the uh, let's let's find a good picture of these. So this is the magnetic array uh, that he's using. This is from his patent. Um, see how it's a bowl shape? Yeah. Yeah. And he, that's that's the bowl that you're seeing there, that black hub, like the, the hemisphere. That that's what that is. It's a bowl shape. All right, and what's the purpose of this entire device? Let's say it works 100. percent What's it doing? Uh, just that one would be just to to, to create energy and shit. Um, you on Jeremiah? 
Yeah, yeah, I just got back. I finally got on with my computer, so let me just turn this down so you guys can hear me. Can you hear me all right? Uh, we can hear you all right. Um, he, uh, Sean is showing us some uh, magnet device. I'm not really sure what yeah, it is. Take a look at that, Mark. I want you to take a close look at this device because it's it's really simple, uh, fundamentally. He's showing some really big versions with a huge number of magnets, and you have to look at your screen to see these things. Hey, Sean, find the one with the smallest number of magnets to show him so you can see. What what is it exactly? Are we flying with it, or are we making electricity from uh, you? You probably kinetic could energy? use it to make. Yeah, you could use it for many things like that. Like you probably could use it to make fly. I wouldn't doubt if you if you use it properly. How would but it yeah, fly? That, How yeah, let's take a look at that one. So all this thing is it's a three D printed piece of plastic that has a bunch of holes in it that are you know part of the three D print, and into those holes you just insert magnets. Right. This is the version that has the magnets on the outside. The version that has the magnets on the inside is what he's showing in that video. And he released a 3 3D CAD file so that anybody can replicate that uh, and just order the magnets off eBay or Amazon or anything. Yeah, and by having a bowl shaped like that, it, it defeats Lens Law. And that, that's why there's an acceleration forward. But David LaPointe isn't the first guy to talk about this effect. First was Boyd Bushman with his magnetic femur patent. And um, as Bob Greenier pointed out to me the other day in his uh, live video cast, uh, basically this device operates on some of the same fundamental principles of Boyd Bushman's Beamer. And you can, if you compare those two side by side, you can see the similarities. You have a bunch of magnets, all the poles are the same facing inward. So all, all those faces that you see, each of those discs there facing towards the center, those are all north poles or all south poles facing in. And uh, Bushman's Beamer works exactly the same way. You just use these larger magnets instead of an array like this. But all you need to do is mount any magnets like this in the shape of an inside of a bowl, that's a non-magnetic bowl, preferably plastic. And if they're mounted like this, you'll end up generating a fairly uh, monopole field in the center that has some pretty intense asymmetries. And it's not that the device generates any force on its own, but when something already has forward momentum because it's, it's moving into a monopole effectively and the time transition between north to south and then heading back from south to north, is so different heading straight to the center of that thing, you end up with these differences in the amount of magnetic field that any moving object experiences. So if that moving object happens to be a magnet flying to the center, it goes very easily in one direction if it's already moving and very difficult in the other. And then you pulse the magnet back and forth and that will create linear propulsion? Actually, you just let this thing always fly through in the same direction and you let it go the long way around until it enters back at the point where it exited you know so it enters the back end it shoots out the front and then it does a big old loop and then it comes in the back end again and shoots back out the front and each time it does that it accelerates a little bit but if you put a coil in the way of it then you can decelerate it a little bit so you can kind of control based on the load how fast it's moving through that that circuit mechanically and uh, you can extract power from it as it gains momentum yeah, according well, to the point that's what's to, yeah. supposed to happen with this thing and it's so easy to build that uh, other labs are now starting to finally starting to test it. I know he's had this out there for a while. These videos are not new, but uh, nobody's really looked at it until just recently. It was 2020 in December 2020. I seen one other YouTube channel that's finally printed the thing up. He's got it in hand, and now he just has magnets on order. And so he's actually replicating this thing to see if it works. And I'm hoping to see more of that stuff. There's no reason we can't do it. Yeah. That's what I'm yep. trying to get out. All you got to do is download his CAD file straight from the website and uh, just print that thing on your 3D printer and put the magnets in it. That seems simple enough. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You don't have to do anything or design anything. You just got to pop the file in and print it. And we could uh, figure out other things to do with this bowl with emitters. Like, who knows what we could figure out. Like, it, it might be a perfect thing to start. Like, you know, maybe we could wrap a, um, a pan AK coil on it and test to see if we can make the sucker fly, float or something. Yeah, that'd be real sweet. Because uh, the magnetic array is already doing a, a huge amount of energy it's bringing in, or I should say, you know what I mean. Like it's 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 doing its job. It, we can just utilize it. Well, what's interesting is if you read through Bushman's patent, and the one thing that he states that I've never gotten to work before, but uh, I have, I just ordered parts last night to do the proper Bushman Beamer experiment again. And uh, this time I'm using non ferric metal bolts instead of uh, nylon bolts like last time. <coughs> and somebody was mentioning that the paramagnetism of aluminum may actually have a lot to do with the effect in Bushman's case. So because Bushman is no longer alive and I can't ask the man personally, 
I yeah. have sort of tested with that variation that matches a lot closer to his patent. So I'm gonna machine the ball that's supposed to be in the center of that thing too. And uh, we'll, we'll replicate it as faithfully as possible. There that's it. it. Yep, that's what we have on order. Uh, magnets that are uh, one inch in diameter with a quarter inch hole, aluminum rod uh, that I'll be threading, and then I have to make the ball in the center. So in the back magnet, the rear magnet there, I'll be replacing that last one, part number 10, with uh, electromagnet that takes the same field strength. So it'll have to be a little bit larger, but the difference is I'll be able to turn that thing on and off and reverse the poles if I want to. And so it'll be a high current, low number of turns, low, uh, low capacitance, low inductance electromagnet. And that will hopefully uh, allow me to quickly emit the monopole to switch it on and off and produce some kind of uh, emitted or radiated monopole wave. Yeah, you know what Bushman said about this thing? He said he, he said he could put this thing in a briefcase, walk up to a jet, and totally disable it. Well, that would be one reason why probably not a lot of information is out there about it. <clears throat> I don't know if it'll do that, but what he claimed that it could do, which is mind-blowing if you've ever played with a Bandy Graf generator or a high-voltage power supply, you know, if you set the gap for a Bandy Graf, uh, say you can maximum spark length about four inches. That's just the maximum that it will do before the moisture in the air leaks away too much energy and it can't build up, say, more than a four-inch spark. But what, what Bushman was saying is that you could stretch out the spark to several times its maximum length with this device by just placing the spark in the quote-unquote beam path that this thing produced, this magnetic beamer would stretch out a, uh, a spark that was just a uh, centimeter or so to like several centimeters length. It's somewhere in that patent he talks about just how much expansion he got. But that's a crazy idea. And what he's saying there is he theorizes it has something to do with, you know, changing the momentum of the electrons, allowing them to travel a lot farther with the same amount of momentum when this thing fires. Alrighty. Can't wait to try it though. That'll be fun. <sighs> okay, right now I'm cleaning up some copper over here. Copper wire for the um, to connect the capacitors to the spark gap. Excellent. I'm going to use the same 13 and a half uh, gauge wire that we're using for the coil. Might as well. What do you think of this patent there, Jeremiah? I don't think I've really looked at this one all too deeply. Yeah, that's the Vandegraaff one. No way. Boy, Bushman's Vandegraaff uh, propulsion generator. Holy cow. Yeah. <clears throat> that's wild. I have never seen that. No? No, oh, dude, shit. I've never seen this patent. I can't believe I've never seen this. This is like one of the first patents I've ever seen. <laughs> this is great. Boeing had something similar too. They developed it for military defense. It was supposedly a system that could stop a missile cold in its tracks as it was heading towards the tank. That's awesome. It is awesome. Of course, we don't have any information about it. All the stories and videos that were out there about the darn thing have been totally wiped off the net, which tells me it must have been, it must have been really good. Uh, I wonder if I have that patent. Uh, that makes you assume is that the Humvee one? one? It did it look like a Humvee with a spark gap? It had a huge Vanity Graaff generator inside of it, but it didn't have a belt. It had some kind of uh, particle flow stream. Oh, that's definitely not what I saw. Okay. That sounds way cooler. Apparently it was capable of generating zero to four million volts in a fraction of a second. Sounds like Eve used to be. Whatever it was, I want one. And if I ever did get my hands on that patent, I definitely want to replicate that kind of power from a particle flow system. Absolutely, I will take three. Thank you very much. All right, what have we got else to look at? Okay, here's a good one. Jeremiah, how's your experiment coming along? 
Oh, I tossed him a piece of uh, foil up on that foil there just to see what would happen. I would uh, I would get on and show it to you, but as I said, my phone died and it's still on the charger, so we'll have to wait a few minutes for that thing to come up to par. Oh, okay. Can't wait to order a new one, man. I'm quite glad to get rid of this old phone. Yeah, you really need one. I really do, and it's well past time, so I've got to get one on order like ASAP. I was looking at them again today. I was shopping for them, trying to find a used one. And uh, I, I'm on the fence with whether or not I actually want to get a used one. I've never bought a new phone. I've always gotten used phones. So, you know, maybe it's time I actually get a new one I'm the first owner of. So here's a helium fusion uh, patent that uses deuterium and uh, Xeon. I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, so it uses... Uh, Two parts deuterium and then uh, xeon and with the reaction, you I mean believe. Xenon or xeon? Uh, I don't speak German, so I don't know it. <laughs> Even though I have a German last name, I don't speak it. Is that xenon gas? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, xenon, uh, deuterium and xeon. Um, I thought, I, thought I saw. I thought I had another patent that actually showed a picture of what was going on, but I can't seem to find it on here. Okay, I'm getting close to the. Uh, getting close to lighting this thing up. Just need a couple more yeah. minutes, and I'll be ready to fire. Awesome. All right. The uh, what else we got to talk about? There's plenty, I guess. What do you think of uh, Saversky? Saversky is definitely on it. You think so? Now the legend goes that he tried to build a large version of this, but he was never able to get enough thrust out of it to be feasible, and it was a power to weight ratio thing. So supposedly that was his big limitation. He just couldn't get enough power into it for the amount of energy it took to ionize the air and get propulsion out of his craft. But he definitely was on par in terms of being able to make a fairly large surface area generate its maximum amount of lift. He did understand fundamentally that it was a matter of voltage. And the higher the voltage you had with the finer point you had, the more ions you'd create. What he didn't understand is that the most efficient way to do it was by using extraordinarily thin corona wires. He liked to use a series of spark point emitters or very sharp point emitters, which is effective, but nowhere near as effective as using extremely thin corona wires, which is what uh, ended up being figured out by Tristan Metcalf III later on and by several others in their charge. Uh, Tristan has this patent called charge particle jet engine, or excuse me, charge particle thrust engine, if I'm being technically correct here. And in that system, he states that the only thing which really matters for total thrust efficiency of a system like Seversky's or like T.T. Brown's uh, uh, kinetic motion diversion system that is the basis of, um, what do they call that, ionic breeze by sharper image, their little device that moves air with no moving parts. It's, it's all a basis of high voltage accelerating ions that are in the air. So the longer the distance the ions travel, the more neutral air molecules they hit along the way, and as a result, the more kinetic energy from the electric field that accelerates them is transferred to the neutral air, creating a greater lifting force. And that only happens if you have sufficiently high voltage. So uh, Ethan Krauss on YouTube, he has his own channel, and he has a device that actually has onboard power, which can lift itself and keep itself in the air for up to a little over a minute. Did you it's say Krauss? Impressive. Ethan Krauss. No way! You gotta do this? Yeah, you know, Ethan Krauss has his own lifter version. It's very much like uh, Jane Lewis Snodden's lifter version. Um, he's just got a much lighter material, and he's got a small pulse power supply inside that thing that generates an efficient high voltage. And so, yeah, that thing is self-propelled. He's got a little onboard lithium-ion battery pack, and it'll hold itself up in the air for a short period of time. It's just wildly unstable. What, what Seversky has uh, in this system is still not quite as good as, shoot, what's that other one? Um, this isn't the end-all, be-all patent. We found the other one. There's the another one? To this. It's not Seversky. No, I, I got to Let me pull it in my folder. I would have I jammed it in my charged uh, particle folder. 
So let me go ahead and check my desktop for that. You have to send it to me once you're ready. Well, I'll just tell you the number. It's already on the drive. Okay. I just have to figure out what it's called. Ion and charge particle systems. Let's expand that out and take a look, see if we can find this one. Yeah, there's, there's, there definitely is a superior system out there. I just have to remember what it's called, or should I say find it? It's an old one, too. Oh man, I am not seeing it. I know it's in here. I'm just not finding it. Damn, where is that? Yeah, it's so funny, like, how they deny flying saucers yet, you know, in the 1970s, there's a space vehicle made by the British Railway. <clears throat> no such thing. No such thing. No, no. Not at all. Never existed. We don't even classify them as an aircraft anymore. They're a, they're a maglev train. <laughs> Oh man, I cannot, I cannot find it. That's all right, you know. Well, we could do a whole episode on just that device alone. Yeah, we'll find it someday. That we will. So I'm much for I'm getting close here to uh, powering this up. Um. <clears throat> Good. Let's see something happen. Just don't, don't let the thing blow off your hand. Uh, I have the spark gap set to about uh, an eighth of an inch. That should be pretty decent up to, you know, you ought to fire that right around like 6 to 10 kV. Um, we'll see what happens as I uh, power it up. But now, I just need to hook up the ground and hook up the high voltage. Um, I'm trying to figure out which connector on this, on these terminals I'm connecting the high voltage to. Well, I can't see your screen, so I wouldn't know. It's on the relay. Would it matter which one on the relay, actually? Yeah, it does matter which one on the relay, I think. You don't want to have to go through the relay. <clears throat> one of those wires goes straight from the tube. The other one um, the other one just connects power to uh, from the battery. So you don't want to go on the battery wire. You want to go on the tube wire. <clears throat> All right, I, 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 see I don't remember which one is what. I, I, I see it. I, I was able to see which one it is. I got it set up. Awesome. Now I just need to hook up the resistor train. Well, here's one of my favorite patents. Yeah, that one is awesome. That's a very, very good design. Maximum ionic entrainment to close magnetic loops being repelled and propelled or attracted and repelled at the same time. It's quite ideal. 
Yeah, it's pretty wild. And I and I kept I know this is like an almost like a two D system going on here, like uh for ray systems, just poking up out of the top. Like you would see in the surface of uh like of a two D array you want, right? You said that right. they, that's that's what Ben Derek was working with. Two D lattices or something. Hmm. I I didn't uh I like the magnets and ions tricky efficiently recirculating. I don't know how recently this comment was from uh, Eric Green. If he's talking about GANs or GAN, are you talking about high speed switching MOSFETs or more efficient power supplies? Uh, putting these D cell batteries in into this device is a real bitch. It really is, man. I would apologize, but I didn't design those battery holders. I just stuck them on a piece of wood. <laughs> but I do admit, it's not just you. They're, t they're tricky to get the batteries in and out of those things. No, there we go, I got it. Now this should power up just the tubes, hopefully. Yep, you should be able to see them glowing just ever so slightly. So I had this anti-rust thing on here. Um, where, where should I see? Where should I expect to see glow? You should see it inside the tube. You'll see those uh, those five wires that go from top to bottom. They look like they're just pieces of material to hold it up. Those are actually the filaments that come from the top cap, and they run down past the plate. You'll see them. <clears throat> they glow just a little bit. I mean, they're very very dim. You got to almost shut off the lights. Just Okay, I see glow on one side, I see glow on the other. Okay, so we're glowing. That's good. Good. So it's rectifying then. Yeah, if they're not on, they uh, don't actually block any voltage. Well, they would block everything if they're not if they're on. If they're off. No, it's not actually how it works. You have to have active electron emission in order to suppress current from flowing in the reverse direction. They're more likely to arc over when they're off than when they're on. I'll just leave them on then. Let them warm up. Yeah, they ought to run quite a while off those batteries. I think, uh, what did I time? Like, 45 minutes they'll run off those. Okay, and you got four more, too. I think they're charged. So, if they do run dead. Oh, I, and I yes, was the charging them the entire yes, time. Yes, I did look into GANFETs. Uh, GANFETs are amazing. They are very strange in the mounting packages. I don't particularly like the fact that you have 20 different individual points that you have to attach and route your PCB for. That's my only... Uh, downside to actually implementing them and using them in future circuits is, is the fact that they're mounting well, packages are about? incredibly straight, very small. What are you talking about? We're talking about a better type of MOSFET. It's a superior new switching technology called the GANFET, oh, Ganfet and okay. it's much faster and has an incredibly low on resistance than, than normal um, SIC FETs. But the, the downside is that in order to get those kind of speeds, they have to reduce internal capacitance and inductance. They have to almost eliminate the Miller capacitance and the gate capacitance. And in order to do that, the way that they create that system is by having very, very short traces from the junction straight to the terminals. And so you have to have complicated board design in order to solder them on. You can't just solder pins straight on like you do with normal MOSFETs. I'll be back in a moment. I'm just going, going to go to the way. Yeah, other than that, though, yeah, we definitely want to go towards GAN. I'm working on it. Titan design that will use GAN FETs, and I'm hoping to see that they do perform as good as their specifications would claim they do. I see what Sean's got up on the screen there. That's a pretty awesome system, too. A photonically modulated or laser modulated ionic beam. This one? Oh, the one that you just had up there, where you yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, about yeah, the wow. in the middle. Yeah, there you go. It'll be bouncing around if you're watching the live stream. Okay, I am going to hook up also the um, oscilloscope to the high voltage uh, uh, voltage divider so that we can get an output. That's a good idea. We'll get an to see if it this. goes in reverse. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what the uh, what the waveform looks like. Um, you think it would be useful to stick a piece of iron in the center, or 
Oh, in the center of what? Of the coil. Oh, you mean to just kind of amplify the field? I mean, sure, yeah, you can do that. Oh, but I, I, isn't your disc going to be in there? Aren't you going to have it fully blocked by the disc? Well, right now I'm just doing the, uh, just doing the coil. Okay, yeah. If you're going to fire the coil dry, putting a piece of iron in there will give the energy some place to go. <clears throat> It'll be less loud if you do that. Okay. Why don't you just stick a big block of bismuth in there for fun? I'm kind of curious what that would do too. Seeing as you have a box of it sitting like behind you. That is a pretty interesting idea. Heck, why not? You got enough of it. You got to. You want to put the energy into something, right? You just dump it into one abysmus. Why not? Is this the patent you were talking about, Jeremiah? Blind apparatus? No, I just went through that one. That's not the one. The one that I'm thinking of, the guy has two corona, or he has he has two wires that are charged to opposite polarity and a wire that's thinner than the other two sitting in between the other two wires, and then he pulses that wire with a very fast impulse to create maximum thrust. You and I talked about it. I'm pretty sure it wasn't Seversky. I just can't find who it was. It looked like Seversky's design. Maybe it wasn't that patent that we were looking at. Maybe it wasn't that paper. Maybe it was the other Seversky patent. It could have been. Can you find that? There's, uh, there's only one Seversky patent. This it? Scroll down. This is a different one. Yeah, that's yeah, I just looked at the Hagen one, and I thought, this is really similar, but it's not the one I'm looking for. It is a very good design, though. All right, well, uh, Seversky. Hagen understood the importance of pulsing the fields. He just didn't have a good way to do it, so he, he postulates this mechanical switch. Which is about as crude as that thing we looked at on my workbench earlier. Something attached yeah. to a motor. Nothing yet, eh? See, I thought. Sorry, like sorry. Yeah, just go back. Um go back for a uh, I actually I'm watching the live stream and then I'm seeing it delayed so it's uh, uh just go down a little bit more I see how he has those juxtaposed it wasn't I want to see the wire array I'm not seeing it there there's a yeah. picture that he has the up close of the wire there's this like square channel that the wire is supported on there's like this kind of square structural channel and yeah, that's the only thing I could think of uh, that that woven maybe grid. Just keep on going down. Maybe maybe it's not this one. If, is that really the only Seversky patent that we have? I'm pretty sure that's the only one. Yeah, then this isn't it. I'll have to find the darn thing. That kills me, man. It was the most effective one I've seen so far. Oh. Uh. Yeah. No, that's not on here. It's going to bug me now. <laughs> I know it's on the drive somewhere, Sean. I just don't know at all where. <laughs> we'll find it. I thought it was maybe EHD. Wait a minute. minutes away from testing this. Alright. Checking up the uh, resistors. Are you seeing anything you recognize, Jeremiah? Not anything. Well, that looks pretty cool. Resistors are wired up. Who owns this patent again? 
Okay, hey, Sean. Okay, so, Sean, that, that patent that you had there, that's one of the best ones for charged particle systems. That's Tristan Metcalf III's patent. If yeah. you scroll down, he actually has an Iron Man suit in this patent. No! Iron Man suit. Yeah, I'm not kidding. So, check this out. Go down. You see this guy standing with these thrusters on his arms and legs. F up. No way. Hey, check out figure 19. That's a hoverboard that's yeah. ion power. Yeah. And keep on going down, you're going to see it. Then ah. you're going to see 20 and tw uh, 28 and 20J. So these are thrusters attached to your uh, arms. These are thrusters attached to your legs. These will push you through the atmosphere. He actually has a whole suit where every part of the suit is an ion emitter and control system. So you can just hover around. You see figure 21K, there's another one where they're strapped to your sides. So yeah, this guy's got like Iron Man tech in here, you know, compact ion technology. And here's what's different about Tristram's patent. Instead of making the ions with corona wires, like most ion jet engines do, in this case, he actually produces them in an external box and he pumps them in via, via an airstream, electrically and magnetically. He pumps the ions that are already made into the grid between the positive and negative plates. And so he doesn't have to produce the ions at a high voltage. And as a result, he can use a lower voltage acceleration potential and get the maximum number of neutral air impacts, allowing him to generate huge thrust with a very small volume of space. That sounds like something to replicate. This is the best patent. Like, uh, let people see the patent number here so they can yeah. go find this. All right. This is uh -huh. the absolute best patent in terms of ion propulsion technology you're probably ever going to read flat out. It's genius. Yeah, if you guys haven't checked that out, you've got to get that. This will be a wonderful read for anybody that's ever built a lifter. It'll teach you so much. I cannot wait to talk to this guy, dude. I've tried to contact this guy for three years now. I cannot get him on the phone. I can't figure out how to get a hold of him. Mm, we're going to have to... But I would love to talk to this guy. Stick Tim after him with his kindness and... I don't even know if he's fine. It's not like he was ignoring me because I didn't say the right things. I just literally don't know how to get a hold of him. Every time I put the soldering oh. iron away, I find another reason why I need it again. Ah, the life of an engineer. This is awesome. I, I can't believe it. I know I remember seeing this pat, but I can't believe I actually didn't hash down fucking refill thing. Pardon my swear. I will be back momentarily. Wow. It's a clever way of doing things. connected now it should should work when I power it up get the uh, let me get the oscilloscope hooked up oh, here she is this is supposed to be an a neutronic fusion pattern we haven't even started delving into fusion research yet. Yeah. I know that'll get us on a few lists once we start with that. Well, if we make a neutronic fusion, it's not hard for it. Theoretically. But with EVOs, you have no idea. Yeah. Okay. EVOs. If they scare Bob, they scare me. I guess I can put it that way. Yeah, that's why I kept telling you guys. I'm like, you can't just make it. And you're like, we're making it. <laughs> we are. I didn't say we're going to go in blindly, but we're absolutely doing it. It's just we're going to educate ourselves before we do something stupid. Like, you know, maybe we shouldn't be right next to the machine because a dark evil is a thing that apparently can exist. And I'd rather not get hit with one. And it can light back up again. Yeah, I'd rather not get one of those stuck in me. Yeah, I could imagine that would suck if you, like, you know, got a little 
the electric discharge and all of a sudden it starts burning. Well, and this ah! is like, like stuff where I can absorb it and re-emit it. That would be interesting. But, you know, we're not going to play around with that quite yet. I'd rather not burn a hole in any part of me, preferably. What are we looking at here, Sean? What is this? Oh, sorry. This is the A-Neutronic patent, uh, Fusion patent. Um, uses a... Uh, oh, what is it? Uh, cyclotron radiation. I was going to say, yeah, it looks an awful lot like that. It's, it's kind of like a cyclotron, but it has these interwoven rings. What does it do? It actually has different acceleration so, layers under, like, the so, uh, dual yeah, This is, like, the fusion effect. That's what it looks like. Is that the actual path of the particles? Yeah, that's what the fusion effect looks like. They, it's like a, um, um, a giant, uh, what do you call it, figure eight effect. Wow, where that's the, weird. Yeah, or the silent points right in the center. Well, it and does if you look, maximize impact area. Yeah, and it's being contained within a magnetic field because you can see magnetic fields that are contained like that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, can you see the magnetic field lines that look like that? That's pretty much what's happening. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there it is. Yeah, there, there's the... Uh, back on, so... Yeah, there's the cyclotron effect. I don't, don't see the double D there. But I see that he has juxtaposed plates there. He has different pl uh, polarity plates that looks like they can switch back and forth. So that's interesting. Yeah, this uh, one's an older one, too, I think. Uh, I don't, this is a Great Britain one. I don't know what the state uh, came It reminds me of the combination between a synchrotron and a cyclotron. Yeah. yeah. I was get, getting the uh, ground hooked up over here. Very good. I'm going to try to call myself one again. Since this isn't Just a negative output for the power the, supply, uh, we are going to be grounding out the positive. Oh yeah, this is supposed to be a really good one too. Uh, Sean, why don't you show something about the... Uh, the ARV, because that's kind of what we're doing over here. Sure. Yep. I'll bring that right up. Yeah, no. the, the center yeah, column of the ARV is kind of what, what right. it is we're working on right now. So, so I'll give I'll give a little quick little education on how the ARV even became. Okay. So um, Thomas Townsend Brown, I'm sure everyone knows about him. He uh, yeah. he worked with a guy named Richard Banderick. Uh, sorry. Not Richard Bedex, my God. He worked with, uh, where the heck is he? <laughs> We're getting our names confused. Uh, it's because it's 11 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock. I'm tired. I'm so hard, man. Uh, I'm tired. Sorry. Anyways. <laughs> so Thomas Townsend Brown worked with a guy named Bonson, Agnew Bonson, and, uh, and, uh, they worked in a lab together, and I'll just show you a little clip from this video. It's a silent video. Um, he worked with a bunch of people in the lab here, and uh, some of these guys, uh, well, I was obviously Thomas Townsend Brown was in here, Agnew Bonds is in here, but there was a guy named King. His name is James King, and he created King, the Air V King Hill. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. Was that Hill? Yeah. No, it was uh, King, uh, on. Uh, James King, Jr. James King, that's right, yeah. Um, Those guys are like the A team of electrogravitics. Yeah. No well, one knows about the other two. It became it became MHD afterwards, right? So, anyways, James. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it, exactly, exactly. It was Bonson that took the MHD because if you look at Bonson's patents, and here's his MHD system. It's EHD and MHD. So on the top there, you got the, your your ion accelerator ring or your ion generator ring, and then you have your three accelerating rings and control rings. So those have a magnetic field running around them, and they have a voltage that's phase three phase to run across them. So you have a moving electric field that grabs onto the ions emitted by that top spiky ring and those three rings beneath it. It grabs onto the ions produced by that and thrusts them down over the bottom shell there. That's part number 23. 
And so it's a really effective <laughs> way to grab onto the ions in the air and create basically a direct upward thrust. And because the bottom of the shell is tapered, what he explains in this patent is that you get this airflow where it's a self-stabilizing system if you're within the gravitational field of a planet. So it'll always keep itself upright. Uh, it's amazing. I didn't even realize that. That is really, really And you can cool. change the field vector. So see there in figure 4B, what he's saying is if you change the field vectors and you tilt, you'll get this directional thrust, and it's self-leveling. So you just have to create these other fields, and there's a, there's a segmented part of the system that you can control which ring gets which voltage, and you can direct them and phase them differently so you can have directional thrust. Yeah. Um, hold on, I'll get to just want to pop it here. Bonston. So yeah, uh, and Bonston's, you know, some of his patents right here, like, you know, like this one right here explains the bottom a little better too. Yeah. Yeah, there's his control system. And uh, Nodden screwed with this too. He actually had a CAD model of a system that operated very similarly. And he uh, did some 3D graphs to show how the electric fields would allow for that, that steering of the flux and consequent steering of the force. And, um, okay, so um, back to MHD. So here is obviously the ARV. I got a really nice detailed picture. Like you can well, literally not around read. Too much. Um, you you can actually read it. Like, you know, it's nice and clean. Why don't you uh, go back to the center of it uh, so we could see that clearly. Because that, that's what we're working on right now, is those coils. Zoom out a bit. These guys. Yeah, zoom out a little bit so we can see. The, those coils over there with the uh, disc in the center, uh, okay, just don't move it, uh, is what we're working on right now. Uh, the disc in the center, we have uh, several aluminum discs, and these are made out of 5052 aluminum. The reason why we chose 5052 is because um, it had the correct properties, it had a little bit of iron, and it also had aluminum mixed with um, magnesium. Now, magnesium and aluminum have similar properties in terms of dynamic nuclear orientation, which is what we believe would create weight loss. Um, so this mix worked out perfectly. Also, 50-52, that's mixing 51, like area 51. I don't know if there's a connection, but kind of interesting and um, this coil we have over here is coupled to these uh, massive capacitors just like in the base of the ARV you have those big capacitor array if you zoom out a little bit you can see those capacitors in the base why don't you zoom out yeah those capacitors in the base are being represented by these white um, capacitors over here high voltage Maxwell's and the coils right over here so we're doing first a dry run with just the uh, coil and the capacitors, we have a little spark gap that's going to allow for the, um, the electricity to flow back and forth in a solar cell for, uh, format. And uh, we have also the rectifier tubes to protect the power supply um, because there is going to be a positive jolt as soon as uh, the, the charge is released so that it'll be going back and forth. Um, we don't want that going back inside our power supply. So we're just about ready to power it up. Um, you can see right over here I have a um, scope set up. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, take over the screen. And we're just about ready to uh, get this experiment uh, going. Um, this is the spark gap over here. Uh, it's set to about, uh, about an eighth of an inch. It's kind of hard to see. You will see sparks uh, going between those two uh, bowls. And if all done correctly, you know, you would see the sparks and we're going to see also the waveform and the frequency on our oscilloscope. I'm going to turn off the lights a little bit. I'm going to dim the lights a bit so we can see, see this a bit better. Um, okay, now I'll turn this one on. I'll turn everything else in the shop off. How's that? Okay, so now we're just going to power it up. Turn all the way down, and
Hey, Sean, stop, uh, stop sharing your screen just for a second yep. so that it defaults to marks. Oh, I'm seeing some sparks inside the, uh, inside the uh, array. There is some sparks there. Too bad you can't get your camera closer. That's not good. Is are the tubes on? Tubes are on. Are the tubes? They're they're turned on, but you're getting some sparks. What voltage are you at? I'm getting sparks inside the coil. Inside the coil. Coil to uh, the coil to itself. I'm getting sparks. Oh oh! You're actually triggering the system, and it's working correctly. You know what I'm saying? Inside the coil. Uh, windings of the coil are sparking to themselves. Okay, I understand what you mean now. I understand what you mean. No, that's uh, that's not to be unexpected. That's why I was mentioning to you that if your inside winding is close to your outside winding, you're at the start start of the wire, your wire to the end of the wire are too close, you're going to get sparks. That's why I recommended that you use that small superconductor coil because the way that I wound that is specifically designed to prevent that kind of problem. Because the uh, the inside winding, the start winding, is as far separated as possible from the outside winding, and you'll be able to put all kinds of power through that coil. Unfortunately, you know you're going to have to decrease the distance of your spark gap. I can't hear you on Skype anymore, though. Oh, I wasn't saying anything. Um, oh. Uh, yeah. So I I am seeing some sparks over here. It is it does not seem to be going into reverse. I was just getting you know charging up, getting a spark, and that's it. That's all I was getting. And down on the scope, then? I didn't watch your scope waveforms, but uh, if they're not going in reverse, that's very, very good. That mean, means your supply is at no threat of being damaged, and the rectifier is working great then. So, hooray for you. You can run that test all day. It might not be good for your coil, but it's fine for your supply. Oh, wow. I'm seeing some really strange things happening. There's sparks that are, like, emitting outward from the coil. I'm going to turn the light off so that you can see what I'm talking about a little bit better and zoom in on just the coil. Hold on. Is there any way that you can get your screen up here, Mark, to share your video on this uh, call? Or I don't know how you're streaming your video on YouTube. I can see it there, but it's just the frame rate's not quite as high as it was on, on the call. So Can you see it now? Unfortunately... I cannot. Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, I can. I can on my computer. For some reason, I can't on my phone. I'm going to end my uh, phone. I'll call back in a minute with that. Okay, so I'm going to power it up again, and I'll, I'll just show you what's going on. I see it. I see the sparking there. You should uh, you should separate those two, those two gaps. I guess they're crossing each other. I would switch over to the superconductor coil. Okay, I'm going to power it down and we'll switch over to the, uh, to the, uh, the superconductor coil. Make sure you short it before you touch it. Uh, okay. There we go. Shorted. That's all good. Okay. So that didn't work. Jeremy's on the chat. We, gotta, we should get him on. Yeah, get, get him on, man. Get him on. Um, well, the, the Skype call is uh, is going right now. He can join in over there. We have um, the link. Yeah, I'll he, send him a link. Yeah, he's already he's already been added to the uh, call. He just needs to uh, jump on Skype to uh, to get in here. Um, Sean, you can start sharing your screen again. Show the uh, show some other stuff while I set this up. Right on. Actually, I can show you guys something here. I can call in real quick. So, uh, let me get this on screen. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. Uh, yes, one moment, and get me off. Yeah, that's not the video screen I wanted. <sighs> A lot of work to set this up. Now I've got to take it apart. Okay, um, so I'm not sure if anybody can see what I'm looking at here. Oh, you know? well, we can see it. Okay, well, cool. Yeah, so check this out. I was just going to do a quick demonstration about the kind of power that's going through this coil. So I have a piece of glass that's up on this coil, and I have a piece of foil that has a slice in it. And this will just show you, this is 
representing a single turn of wire. And so I can start the spark app here. And I can then connect the power. <laughs> Notice that I'm tucking and sparking the device with my hand. And uh, that's because there's almost no voltage here. The impulse is so fast. It's fused to the glass. It has fused to the glass. That's insane. That, uh, like... It's actually That's embedded a, in the surface there, so uh, yeah. It's anyway, not like EVs. The peak current there, we're probably looking at right around 50,000 amps or so. I mean, it may be lower than that, but I wouldn't doubt that this kind of emission is potentially as high as 50 kiloamps. I, I, my other system generates 1.5 megaamps, so uh, again, I wouldn't doubt it. That's not bad from a tiny little summing capacitor bank. Those are each one microfarad at uh, 1,200 volts. No other way around. They're 1.2 microfarads at 1,000 volts. That's right. And there are four of them in series on one side, four in series on the other, those two banks in parallel. Well, that was the uh, that was just what I wanted to show you guys. So Mark is just about ready. He's got the superconducting uh, pot kind of coil set up, or pour coil. It's more of a pour coil. And uh, so we'll get back to that. I'll get off the call on my phone. Okay. Yeah, I think for, for future um, experiments, we probably should wind a coil using the heavier duty uh, wire, and um, we got to get a proper uh, coil making mechanism. It's it's not about the insulation thickness of the wire. It's about how the wire is wound. You just need to make sure that when the electricity enters from the electron side that the electrons never get a chance to jump through the insulation towards the output side of the anode side. So that it's, it's a matter of how you wind it. As long as your incoming winding is not close to your outgoing winding, then you don't have an arc over problem, but you need to create physical space. And that means you have to wind it on the bobbin. There's no way around it. You have to wind it on the bobbin, otherwise it's gonna cross over at some point and be too close. All right, that's what I was talking about. When you get that bobbin done correctly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, is Jeremy on the on the call yet? I called him, but I don't think he picked up. He must have been. He probably was using his phone or something. Who knows? Right. Oh, there he is. Yeah, we tried calling. He did. Okay, just to be clear, we, we ran into some technical difficulties over here with the experiment because of the, uh, the way the coil was round. It was arcing over on itself. And uh, we're going to have to redo this coil winding. So we're using this other small coil, smaller coil right over here. We're going to try the same, uh, the same setup with that. It also has some uh, steel screws in the circuit, so that will provide a little bit more uh, inductance to the circuit. You should toss some of those little magnets on top of it so you can really see it working in the video. And also, get your uh, if you're about to run that experiment, when you do, just make sure you go full screen. I will. Right now, Sean's uh, navigating the amazing database. Oh, yeah, and Jeremy's not at home right now, he said. Oh. That, that dirty scoundrel. I'm yeah. going to do that. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah, what do you recommend for spark gap uh, distance on this? On that coil? You're probably looking at about a 10 kV isolation. So again, I would, I would keep it underneath probably six millimeters or so. Um, then that's just based on 
the 10 millimeter diameter of those spheres, that should be about 10 kV to 15 kV discharge. And when they start to get hot, they'll discharge a little bit earlier. So that's uh, one thing. Jeremy says, call me on WhatsApp or cell phone. He's down at the house. So can we get him on the call? Um, no, we can't really do that. He, he can he can call in from his phone on Skype. Yeah, Jeremy, you're going to have to use Skype tonight if you want to get in. Well, here's the plasma capacitors you really like. Oh, you did. You did get the patent. Oh, you. I see which one you have. Yeah, this is one of the plasma capacitors that I really like. This is one of the two. This one and Naughton's uh, patent are both amazing, and I really, really want to build this. But it requires a special material. Huh. Okay, and he said, what's his name, Naughton? Naughton. Naughton has one called Energy Generator, I think it's called. I don't know if I have them on here. Maybe it's electric. Uh... Let me look it up. He's on here uh, on my drive. And yeah, he's on your drive because he's on my drive and you have my drive. So he's definitely somewhere on there. Let me just take a look at what uh, that category name is. What did I put him under? Uh, Self-powered and radioactive technologies. And it is called. Oh, I didn't label it. I'm terrible. Oh, this thing is awesome what you have up there. Okay, so check this out. That's a capacitor. It's made like a capacitor. It's a plate on the top and bottom, but inside of it is this material. Just like brown, it is a epoxy mixture saturated with little conductive particles of a metal. And by ramping AC into this thing, the patent claims that this externally insulated capacitive material with metal particles in it generates an electron field, which ionizes the air surrounding this device for several feet. So I built one, naturally wanting to try this, and it <laughs> completely didn't work at all, <laughs> which I guess I wasn't that surprised by. But uh, I may not have used the right materials. In, in, in either case, um, supposedly that's what it claims to do is generate an electron field. And again, as we talked about with monopoles, with uh, you know Ron Kita's monopoles and T.T. Brown's monopole electrodes and stuff, what we end up with is these charges that are trapped on the metal particles inside the structure, and they can't escape or jump off easily. So this is, again, related to Van Durek, as we were talking about earlier. This is another situation where you have tiny little individuated charges trapped within a superstructure and you're exposing them to changing electric fields. Fascinating. You see a lot of this stuff. It's a repeated theme. Okay, we're seconds away from this uh, next experiment. Top notch. There's the coil. You can also see the spark bat there. Okay, I'm just going to power it up now. Um, hey, Mark, why don't you get yourself full screen first because you're still in the corner. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me get full screen. All right, Sean, let's stop sharing for a second. Let's get Mark full screen. I think he'll default if you just stop sharing. No, I got it. I got it on the... Uh, you got it? Okay. I got it on the stream. Um, I can control what you see on the stream different from what's on the uh, uh, Skype call. So you can continue whatever you're doing on the Skype call. It doesn't really matter. Um... I'm just going straight through the uh, video output of the laptop. Okay, so I'm ready to uh, charge this up. Wait, you think I should put some iron in there first? That's an option. I have this little plug over here that fits in perfectly. Hey, Sean, it's called electrical power source, the patent that I was thinking about. Oh, 
Okay. And I stuck two chunks of uh, iron, one on top of each other, inside the coil, and we are going to power it up and see what happens. I'm standing back. That should work. Oops. I forgot to turn on the, uh, the tubes. We're not on. We'll give them a second to warm up. How long does it take to warm up these tubes, Jeremiah? They only take a few seconds, Mark. Okay. There are sparks going all over the place in there. Well, that's certainly not successful then. Okay, I think I understand now why the uh, ARV has its coils inside of an epoxy. High voltage isolation. Mm. Absolutely. Yep. These coils are not going to work. And I'll just try oh, it again. Well, it worth a try. I'll try it again without the iron. Just see. Uh, see what happens. Yeah, there's some nasty sparks going on there. We might be damaging the coils. Well, try, try again, as they say. Okay, well, at least I have the circuit set up. So when we build the uh, system correctly, we will be able to um, Oh, when we build the coil correctly, we'll be able to run this experiment and uh, and see what happens. But uh, I'm I'm starting to understand more and more why they had to do every little step that they did building this ARV. Why there was um, a need for like a glass. The coils were embedded in glass, or we could probably do the same thing with epoxy. But it is important when making these coils that they are high voltage isolated, so there is no short. Um, you know, between the uh, coil pieces. And uh, neither coil that we have in stock at the lab worked. Uh, they both shorted out to their coil windings. And uh, we're gonna have to rethink this and uh, build, that, build that coil properly with the proper bobbin. No yep, way around. I totally that. agree, I totally agree. And that's something we can absolutely do. It's good wire. We just didn't wind it properly. I'm thinking maybe um, in between each layer of windings, we could put we could cover it with Kapton. Yeah, if we just wind them in as uh, one layer at a time and just wrap some Kapton between them, it'll work very well. We don't even have to use something expensive like Kapton. We could just literally use regular tape, and uh, it would be just fine. Regular masking tape, one inch wide, and make a bobbin one inch wide to match it. No problem. Well, Captain's not that expensive, and we have plenty of it, so I'm not too worried about that. I'm just worried about making it work. Um, and then on top of yeah, that, we'll pour epoxy. That stuff's reliable. On top of that, we can pour epoxy and just get it all covered oh. properly so that there's absolutely no way for it to uh, short to itself because that is what we are seeing with both coils. Um, so that's something uh, to work on for the next uh, next phase of this experiment. Well, I can't wait to uh, build the all electric motion electric field generator there with all that wire. That's going to be one heck of a build and rather cumbersome, bending that wire back and forth some uh, 2,000 something times. But we can do it. That'll be very interesting to test on the full scale, just like uh, was originally set up in the patent. 
Oh, uh, okay. I, I see uh, Eric Green commented, you guys should crowdfund a few experiments. Yes. Uh, we do have a uh, GoFundMe page set up. And... Uh, I think that's in the, the link to one of our videos. Uh... And somebody else mentioned uh, you should get superconductors. Uh, we do have superconductors. We're using those for different experiments. If you're talking about making a superconducting uh, coil, it's not really that wouldn't really fix the problem here. The problem here is that uh, we're we're putting such high current into the coil that the um, potential between one piece of the wire and the other, <clears throat> even though there's only like one ohm difference between them, there's a very high voltage potential between them because of the high current and it's able to jump the air gap So the technically insulation. superconductors do actually solve that problem because there is zero potential between the in and the out. Well, we'd have to have a superconducting coil similar to what you have. Exactly. And if we had a superconducting coil, then we would effectively have Nasikas. And then we would have force just with that coil alone. Uh, I saw the Nasikas uh, thruster was tested and it did not provide any thrust. Uh, it was tested by its inventor, I think. I seen a paper that indicated quite the opposite, so I'm not sure. Uh, again, I have never personally built one. It's an interesting idea, but the concept that it produces the force on its own with no external inputs, I guess that's a bit hard to swallow, really. Yeah, I can agree with that. He claims that it was independently verified by three different uh, sources, and I have yet to actually see database lab results. I know that there are subjective lab results where witnesses claim to have seen it, but that's a different story entirely. So after all, he was asking for some not incredibly large amount of funding, you know, less than 100K, but he wanted to build his version 2 thruster that should have had significantly more force. And if, instead of being just a shaped cone like it was previously where the superconductor was solid, he wanted to build a coil version of that superconductor where he could actually run current through it. You're talking and, about uh, Paula Violet, right? What's that? Are you talking about Paula Violet? No, I'm talking about Nasikas. Nasikas version 2 thruster was a tapered cone superconductor, but instead of just being a solid piece, it was made into a coil with multiple layers. Right, right. And uh, he wanted to run current through it at the same time as it produced its effect. Paula Violet tried that. Magnets. He actually got funding and he tried that and they saw no, no uh, thrust. Did they? I haven't seen that paper yet. I'd really like it's to read that. It's not a paper. It was a video. Any links. It's a video? It was a video. Um, I think he posted it on Facebook. It might be on YouTube as well. Um, check, Let oh. me know about that video. I've never seen that, but I would really, really like to see that. I think it was about two years ago that they ran it up in uh, Rochester, New York. They, uh, yeah, that's recent enough. It could have been tangible. I really got to see that. I haven't even heard of it yet. Please link me to that, though. Definitely don't forget to do that. I've got to take a look at that information. Okay, uh, Jeremiah, do you have anything else to show from the lab? Nope, that's pretty much it for the lab tonight. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna shut this down. I think we uh, we saw enough experiments for the night. Um, we know where we need to go from here. We need to build a better uh, coil, and we understand why they needed so much isolation for the ARV. It was because of the um, the voltage potential between the wires. You know, we, can, we need to make sure that it doesn't jump between the wires, just like we saw over here in these experiments. And uh, once we get that done correctly, it will probably work. We'll have to see. That we will. That we will. One step at a time and continuous progress, never ceasing. We'll get there. All right, folks, we're heading out of here. Take it yep. easy. Peace. Peace.